Hype House, for as little as $1 a month, you can support the best Miami Vice podcast on the internet. We promise we won't use the money to find a freezer tube in the Atlantic or fund bull semen transactions. To see all the benefits of supporting us directly, including early show access or even a free mustache, head on over to patreon.com slash go with the heat. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 5, Episode 5, titled Boroska. It's a little on the nose. Like, a little derivative on the name, actually. Like, you know, our main person is Boroska. <laughs> yeah. We're going to name it after Boroska. No creativity here. You can tell. It's Episode 5. <laughs> They're already mailing it in. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Writings on the wall. <laughs> it originally premiered on December 9th, 1988. John, this is where your revenge comes against me. The writer is Vladislavo Stepakudza. You son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. You want to try that one more time? <laughs> Let me give you both the names. You tell me which one is a pseudonym. We have Vladislavo Stepakudza. Kutza or Elvis Cole? <laughs> Elvis Cole sounds definitely like a pseudonym. <laughs> Not Vladimeska Stelioma. <laughs> well, you'd be right, because Elvis Cole is actually known as Robert Crace. Robert Crace wrote the episode Payback way back in season two. But for some reason, he wanted to put a pseudonym on this episode. <laughs> it's funny to say he wanted to put a pseudonym on it, but Vern Gillum, the director, did not. He also directed Child's Play and The Cows of October. He should have put a pseudonym on that one. <laughs> so so th this might be the highlight of his uh, con contributions. He still got two more episodes coming, by the way. Mm. So that's the thing. The Revenge <laughs> of Bull Seaman. <laughs> Before we get started, we can check in and see what's in each other's lives. Pals, we didn't follow back up on something. We mentioned months ago now that The Watchmen was being like tossed around by HBO and Don Johnson was rumored to be one of the people that was cast in that show. Well, here we are months later. HBO has officially picked up The Watchmen and it does have Don Johnson in it and also some other people you may know like Jeremy Irons and Lou Gossett Jr. Yeah, just some little people you may know. <laughs> yeah, and I will admit this is this might actually push me to pay for HBO or to try harder to steal it at least. <laughs> so there was also an interview with the creator slash director that's going to be handling it for HBO. I forget his name. He's done a bunch of work for HBO. And he said this is going to be like a modern spin on the existing because the existing was like set in the 80s. They were old, but it was in the 80s. So they're going to like modernize it and not leave it set in the 80s. Hmm. Yeah, because the uh, Watchmen is basically that superheroes have been around since the early in the 1900s, basically, or er earlier in history. It kind of writes them into all these historic, like World War II, Vietnam, it kind of wrote that their existence in all of that. So by the time we get to the movie, The Watchmen, it is 1985. Richard Nixon is on his third presidential term. <laughs> oh, that didn't happen. Thank God for that. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it's history has shifted because of the existence of superheroes. So in like the movie, The Watchmen is largely about in 85 with nixon being president again and virtually the cuban missile crisis how that would have been with nixon involved well i think what the important thing here is is that everything that we ever wanted from the 80s is all gonna be crammed into one superhero show on hbo we may have found a show to follow up after vice exactly <laughs> yes well, speaking of old things that are learning new tricks, let's go talk about how Castillo is a murderer. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> He's not a murderer. When we open up, it's a chicken. Uh, uh, I mean, I guess. Nice cock. <laughs> it's a cock. I was going to say, it's a man stroking his cock. Let's get it straight. <laughs> it's the best chicken yeah, having yeah, lunch I mean, with his best people. Yeah. Uh, it's just, I, I agree with Melissa. He's clearly stroking a cock because, I mean, why would a guy be sitting out uh, holding a chicken? A cock, that <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why did he bring his cock to lunch? Nobody knows. But... The music is very intense for the street fair that's happening at the time, too. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> strange music for, like, a street fair. Like... <laughs> I 
going to be honest, during the Open, I wasn't very sure of what was going on at all, except that it broke out into a big gun battle and that that guy is definitely dead. Yeah, I did not understand that it was supposed to be in Miami. I thought it was like in some other country. <laughs> like, what is going yeah, on? Yeah, it, it definitely did not look like, like Miami. Uh, so it was a surprise to see Vice investigating it. I thought they'd somehow found their way to Columbia again. When this limo comes pulling up and you see, like, the exchange of, like, the cock man wanting to buy the drugs. <laughs> and then they got the money in the trunk and things don't work out. And it's like, these little peons just need to deal with what I'm willing to give them. That was all expected in my mind. But not the revolutionaries on the rooftops firing AKs yeah. into the limo onto the street. Everybody like, had a gun. Everyone poked out, like people from rooftops, people on um, balconies. <laughs> like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, like once upon a time in Mexico style shootout just breaks out around the limo. So, I and I thought a- he offered him a fair amount of chickens for those drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a wrap ready to go, but I decided not to use it at the last minute. Car pulls up. Who can it be? (laughs) And then the chicken man comes walking up and drops his prize cock on the dead man from the limo who insulted him with this puny $500,000 offer. But why did the chicken have to die? That was cruel. Why did that poor cock have to die? What did that cock ever do to anybody? (laughs) Just be a cock. That's all it did. (laughs) Uh Probably made him a lot of money too. And he just killed it for no reason. (laughs) The only thing that other than the cock... Okay, I'm going to say the only thing? (laughs) Was that (laughs) clearly the... The other main person from, as we find out later, this is our person, Boroska, that we're going to follow the, the entire time, is that they killed, they killed that guy. It wasn't the person in the limo or anything, like his own men shot him as he tried to ru- run away and, the, and they opened fire on the on the limo. And that's, and that's why I was saying, like, I really didn't understand what was going on, because as, like, we have this big shootout, and it looks like, like he said, his own men can kind of turn on him. And then throughout the episode, they don't add up as far as the criminal enterprise goes. I don't think they understand how to be drug dealers. <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits. This is our moment to check in with the guest stars. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of names on this list that I've never heard before. <laughs> what do you got for us this week, John? I'm starting to notice that season five, we've taken a step down as far as guest stars. So not <laughs> only are we trying to save money... Uh, on music, we are trying to go budget ourselves as far as guest stars go. <laughs> Don't be expecting any more Julia Roberts. I'm just saying. <laughs> First guest star, Juan Fernandez, who plays Martello Barasca. He's actually been in quite a few movies. You might recognize him from Crocodile Dundee 2. He was in L.A. Takedown, the Michael Mann TV movie version of Heat. So one of his earlier movies was a movie called Bulletproof. 1988 with Gary Busey, which just looks fantastic. <laughs> he was also in a in a 2003 movie with Jean Claude Van Damme called In Hell. Well, why haven't we seen that? What the <laughs> he, he's done a he's done a few few better movies. He did a Man Apart. Actually, he wrote, directed, and produced a Dominican movie called El Gallo in 2013 which actually has an IMBD rating of 8.7 out of 10. <laughs> Our next big guest star is Gabriela Roel, who plays Lu- Lucia Moran. She's a Mexican film and TV actress and telenovelist. She's actually been in a bunch of Mexican films and TV. Some of her earlier work that really caught my attention was Tacos de Ora from 1985. I thought she was really good in that. <laughs> but I think my favorite movie with her is Bandidos in 1991. Uh, you should really check that out. So our next guest star is Carlos Sesteros. He plays Arturo Ur- Uribe. Also played Frank Ariola, customs agent and brother to Tico in the episode Kill Shot. So uh, he, he's a returning guest star. <laughs> Cesaros is uh, best known for his roles in Scarface in 83. He was in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country in 1991, and the movie Paradise Lost in 1999. Our last guest star, Brian James, 
Brian James. He plays Edward Reese. So, and he's actually our biggest guest star, as best known for his portrayal of Leon Kowalski in Blade Runner, uh, which is where I know him from, as well as The Fifth Element, because he plays the general in The Fifth Element as well. I mean, both those are great movies, but uh, because the most important role he's ever been in is Tango and Cash. I was going to say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was also Tango accent. and Cash. <laughs> and not just Tango and Cash. He was in a slew of 80s and 90s action films. Like 48 Hours, Another 48 Hours, Red Heat, and Red Scorpion. All the Reds. <laughs> <laughs> that means he was in Red Heat with Arnold Schwarzenegger, then Red Scorpion with Dolph Lundgren. And standing at six foot three, he was uh, he found himself usually cast as a heavy... Otherwise, like a thug or criminal action movies in the 80s and 90s. He appeared for 100 films before his death in 1999 of a heart attack, 54 years old. His parents owned a movie theater in Beaumont, California when he was growing up. And his early TV roles would feature Roots the miniseries and also guest appearances in Gunsmoke, The Incredible Hulk, Mork and Mindy, Chico and the Man, Chips and Dynasty, as well as the 90s Highlander series. Now we're talking. There's now we're talking. Yeah. <laughs> Can we just talk about how great the cast is from Tango and Cash? Uh, Kurt yes. Russell, Sylvester Stallone, Robert Zadar, um, Brian James. Jack, what's mm-hmm. his name? Jack Palance? Yeah, something? Jack Palance. Woo, I love it. Mm-hmm. When we come back from the opening credits, we're back at the crime scene and the police are investigating. Stan, Trudy, and Tubbs are talking. The gang used armor piercing bullets on the limo. Because, you know, you do that. Mm-hmm. Stan and Tubbs are talking. Trudy is actually working. <laughs> and also, the armor piercing bullets would make up for the fact that all those bullets didn't p- put any holes into the limo in the beginning. Just, you know, just, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> Trudy says she found a videotape from one of the tourists. Tourists is disappointed because it doesn't have any X rated stuff on it. She's like, fine, I'll go check it out. <laughs> right before the scene ends too Stan throws a little comment out there about how Tubbs looks about the beard I, I disagree just this vague recollection didn't have one last week and then he's got one this week and it looks and, really different and then in this next it. scene he loses the beard because we're at this bar and they talk about it and Tubbs and Stan are going to talk to someone who's done work with De La Carta, the man who died in that shootout now hold on oh my god look at Stan in this scene with his hair combed over with the mullet in the back yep the hair slicked back with a mullet and he's wearing mm-hmm. a nice suit I mean he's no Crockett but he's no slouch you know? <laughs> <laughs> Crockett who are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> they're like trying to get information out of this guy he tries to run they're what they're trying to find out is who he was trying to do business with and he says it's the cock wielder that's who he was doing <laughs> business with the cock wielder i mean boroska <laughs> be on the lookout for a man with cocks he's presumed <laughs> armed and dangerous <laughs> Back at the precinct, Castillo is briefing everyone. They're actually doing a nice PowerPoint presentation <laughs> yeah, of everyone that's in the gang. The dangerous crime ring. I, oh, I love when cold. they break out. For, I love when they break out the printer. They're going over the this military group that they're going after, and they're showing the different. I, I guess it's not a big group. It's only three members. So, <laughs> but they're they're still going over it, and we have one member who is an ex cop who apparently still wears his full cop uniform out in public. <laughs> We we have a dreamy guy. Got some dreamy eyes and yeah, he's, uh, just he's looks a heartthrob. Like, well, yeah, yeah, it just looks like a headshot, and, and then some jackass. They all known by the DEA. They're all from Puerto Rico, and they've hijacked a freighter coming from Colombia that apparently has like a hundred million dollars worth of cocaine on it. Which seems kind of you, you should be skeptical of that. Also, the DEA should be on top of that. What the fuck? There's a hundred million dollars of cocaine uh-huh. that's just known by local police departments. Maybe they're hoping Vice takes care of it for them. <laughs> Not their jurisdiction, but you know, that never stopped them before. Tub says, "Oh man, this is like this would be an amazing case if I could work with Sonny on this." Everyone's kind of like, uh, uh. "Shh, don't say his name." <laughs> <laughs> There will be, as we've hinted at a few times, there will be no appearance by Sonny in this episode. And no talk, no real talk of him, like where he is. Mm-hmm. He's still with that redhead at that bar. Mm-hmm. He's hitting it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting down. Sonny's playing, playing country singer, Mitcher. <laughs> exactly. Castillo says, no worries. I know someone that can help us, though. So they go over to the furniture shop. <laughs> 
he makes furniture. It's a solid. <laughs> it's a solid thing. I, and I love this. They go in and they meet with the furniture dude, and they just start talking. You know, hey, you know, hey, it's been five years. You don't call or write no more. And the dude's like totally with it. He's, oh yeah, man. Like I'm so bored. I'll totally go undercover for you. I miss the old days when I didn't make furniture all day. I have a question. I know this is going to kind of go off topic here, but is he supp- did he die in that episode of Highlight? And the ep- that guy who desperate to get back into the drug game and bring some people down. And Melissa, you were saying when we were watching this, he was so excited that for sure he's going to die. <laughs> he doesn't stand a chance. Oh yeah, he did <laughs> right away. So Arturo immediately <laughs> goes to the Molino Rojo bar. And he's getting drunk with some old timers. And he's, I mean, it's like the worst. I'm secretly trying to find information without saying, he's like, ah, man, my boss just, he just loves drugs so much. <laughs> just, and you know what? To make it, to make my career better, I wish I could get him some drugs. Anyone know of any gigantic boats with large <laughs> yeah, quantities of exactly. drugs on them? <laughs> yes. Yeah, everyone's yeah, well, listening to my him. My boss is really on me about this. He said that, that there's a big ship out there full of just cocaine. And we, I would just, I'd really like to get him some. <laughs> everyone's listening to him at the bar too like people are turned the one of the people he's with at the bar goes up to the bar to go get a drink but still listening very intently like no hmm, well, that's a little weird <laughs> yeah meanwhile the other guy's like hey if you go 50 50 on the commission i'll help you figure out where this boat's at and so then of course arturo in true he must be a real member of vice because then he doesn't call it in or anything he just immediately goes and tries to take care of it himself and this is where you can see the rustiness with him from being a furniture maker for so long <laughs> he's like stalking around the boat and, and he's doing a good job like no one notices him he even looks in and sees them looking at looking at the jugs and that's where we first see the really hot chick who um <laughs> with the big who thing. i guess she's a waitress and she just kind of moonlights at, at at the boat uh <laughs> does she get i don't know what she does so he sees all this and then it's, he, he he makes a little noise he gets spooked and when he jumps, he jumps in the water and his splash like gets everybody's attention. Like if he had just like not jumped in the water, no one would have even noticed he was there. My favorite moment of this scene is when the two guards come running over and one guard just fires off some warning shots. <laughs> not in the water, he just kind of shoots him into the air. Yeah, like whatever. <laughs> and the other guard says, hey, I have a feeling who I, I know who that was that was just here sneaking around because it's the guy that was at the bar yeah, that went to go yeah. get the other round. Yeah. Ends up being the same person. You know, when you're just kind of at the bar like, you know, I got some drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone got uh, some boat drugs? <laughs> I need some boat drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Credit to Arturo, though, for getting there in a rowboat. Man, that's hard I know. ass work. But also, like, isn't that an obvious thing? Like, don't you make a lot of no- noise in a rowboat? <laughs> they try and make it like he he snuck in and looked at it, and that the guy figured out who it was because of the bar. But in reality, they were probably just standing on top of the boat, like, look at this jackass in the <laughs> rowboat coming at us. Exactly. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the street, Stan and Tubbs are looking amazing. Walking around Hooker Alley. All business, baby. <laughs> no, because Tubbs doesn't have the beard. And he's wearing a polka dot suit. As they're walking, Stan says, I got to stop and make a phone call. He goes into a restaurant. He calls Gina. And it's a, it's like the shortest conversation he's ever. He's like, yeah, uh-huh, bye. <laughs> and then he immediately makes another call and places a bet. Now, we have some advanced knowledge on this, but it's very clear that that's what he was doing. And hat tip to Miami Vice for sneaking this in. Just this one little, little thing. Stan's acting suspicious. He makes this call. He covers up. He lies. He comes out. He lies to Tubbs. He says that Gina gave him some information. He says that Arturo had some information. But the call to Gina was a fake out. But also he says when Tubbs come, when he goes back to Tubbs, Tubbs is like, oh, did you get, did you work everything out? He's trying to tell him he, he was supposed to meet a woman, that he called a woman to like to confirm their date. He's like, yeah, I don't want to leave her hanging. And then also I called Gina and you know, all that information. So yeah, he's just lying so about everything. So Gina's not his bookie. <laughs> no, or his girlfriend. <laughs> because I know I'm like spoiled a little bit on what's going to happen with Stan, I do appreciate like this. We didn't just get dumped into an episode where he's got a gambling problem. No, yeah. We're going to get these little hints leading up to it. Yeah, that's not that's not the only one you get. So now they're going to go off and go talk to Arturo to see what he's been able to find out. At the furniture shop, Boroska's men are like sneaking around and they come in with machetes right after Arturo told Joey to go home. Like, Poor why are you Joey. Here so late? Joey, you should have just oh, went he- home. Why'd you have to finish that drawer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought his name was Billy. I was like, poor Billy. 
<laughs> he's in there because he's getting hacked to pieces because of stupid Arturo and wanting yeah. to get back in the drug game. <laughs> Stan and Tubbs come walking up after it's already happened. They go in and immediately run out seeing the brutality that had been unleashed on Arturo and Joey. Yeah, Stan was pretty upset. Not so much Tubbs. He's like, no. <laughs> Uh -huh. Sam was like trying to throw up and tell him, like I've seen it before <laughs> later the police are there nice job Castillo okay nice job you, you got, got your, your friend, friend killed <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. this isn't even the first time it's happened what about that priest huh oh what about don't talk God's about work? him <laughs> Tubbs tries to console Castillo and Castillo seems to be handling it pretty well actually He's like I don't need your pity I'm fine. I gotta go home and work it out later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Castillo says, no, we gotta find that ship. That's where we gotta do. It's not, I'm sad for my friends. I gotta get revenge. So now back out of the club, and <laughs> it's just dancing that's happening on stage. And it looks like it's the interpretive dance that Izzy created. That's I think now he, an official thing. I think thing. he choreographed that. <laughs> I think it, that's what happened. They're like painted uh -huh. in these weird colors, like the first oh. lady's green, like a tree or something. <laughs> Dude, this Evo requires quite a bit of clubbing. <laughs> uh, Stan and Tubbs make the rounds pretty good. This is interesting because this is where we first make contact with the hot Latino chick. <laughs> and, and I notice a theme with the men when dealing with her. Tubbs introduces himself to her. He goes, uh, hey, baby, where's the man that runs this place? That's exactly what he does. Is he says, I want to go out back and go talk to Martillo. And she says... <laughs> yeah, like, no, I don't know who you are. And also, like, how can you not just going through me? I clearly know him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, um, okay. Yeah. This is going to go on throughout the whole episode. Tubbs is either mansplaining or treating her like some chick throughout the whole episode. A little bit later, he's ordering for her or trying to order for her. Come on, man. <laughs> Show her a little bit of respect. When they get shut out from seeing Martillo, Morasca with Lucia inside of the club. So she's the club owner, by the way. Lucia Moron, she owns that club. So, so they're just waiting outside for Martillo's bodyguards to come out. So they're going to talk to them. They come walking up and they're just immediately picking fights. So Tubbs like spits on the car that he's leaning against. They're exchanging some words. He says, Hey, I had a deal with Davia. And I guess Davia can't cut it anymore. And then the bodyguard doesn't like that very much. Can't they see the guys trying to eat his lunch and they're out there bothering him, leaning on his car and stuff? <laughs> he goes and he does that way. He stuffs the napkin in his shirt and Tubbs just loses it. It's like, you know, like this is a new shirt. Some punk in New York tried to touch me once. I'll cut your face, sucker. <laughs> my favorite tubs she goes side i am bitch slapping tubs <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> by the way the bodyguard not impressed <laughs> so after they said all that the bodyguard says okay fine we'll do some business with you meet me at the beach at this address tomorrow at 6 p.m san and rico leave and then they get stopped by another man who wants to set up something else that causes a scuffle but this time rico and stan lose and this is where we meet reese for the first time he said he tells yeah Tubbs. It, it, it's great how he gets their attention too because Reese is like you know he's basically like hey you go you guys want a prostitute and they're like I was like I'm listening and then it's like <laughs> all of a sudden guys jump out and attack him and he pulls a gun on him it's like Cha, got you now tricked you with the pussy <laughs> Now, remember, this is an important story point here because he says at the end, Reese does, he says, make sure you tell Marty he's off the case. Because then when we go to the precinct, Tubbs is describing the man to dad. He's like, yeah, he calls you Marty. Like, he uses this certain accent. And Castile's like, I mean, so he said it like Marty. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's Reese. <laughs> yeah. He's like, did he call me Marty? He's like, yeah, Marty, just like that. <laughs> This we get a little bit of information about Reese that he's a freelance operative for the CIA. So he kind of operates outside of the law. But they don't know why he's working on Borasco here. Sometimes he doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't work for the government. Sometimes he just works on his own. Jump to Dan and Tubbs, way overdressed in all black, 90 <laughs> degrees on the beach. It's like John that doesn't to the beach. stand out at all. <laughs> Stan's wearing like a long duster jacket. And he comments, he even says while he's there, he's like, I'm really hot. This is it. But it's tough. He's like, but you look really good, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sacrifices. <laughs> they sacrifice to look good. They walk up and see the bodyguard, but he's dead. Yeah, so there he's dead. <laughs> the oh, handsome well. one. He'll just leave him on his beach chair with his headphones in. Yeah, I think he was the handsome guy. 
That's the guy with the fancy headshot. Now he's dead. Oh. So later they go, the du- these two, I'm going to call them the duo, because there's no Sunny, so fine. They're the duo. They are not the duo. <laughs> <laughs> they're having a They are the duo, and they're going to start practicing magic together. You'll see. <laughs> Stan is going to try and kill Tubbs. He's never attempted to. No. If anything, he's going to make his beard reappear and then disappear. <laughs> They, Trudy comes up, she gives them some information saying that Ramos was robbed. That's a bodyguard. His name is Ramos or Ramos, as they, as call, they him. call him. They call him Ramos, yeah. <laughs> Trudy goes off to go talk to some witnesses that Stan and Rico go to another table. And this is when Lucia shows up and says, okay, fine, you can meet with Martillo. You got to come to my place first. Okay, but can we talk about how they were drinking waters? Like, <laughs> and Trudy ordered orange juice <laughs> <laughs> at the bar. Yeah, yeah and, Tubbs, juice. and once again, Tubbs tries to, you know, to pull the whole man card and tries to order her. And the lady will have a milk, and she's like, no, tequila. <laughs> I need tequila to deal with these jackasses. you who She's going to have a you who Ice, please. <laughs> that night, of course, when Dad gets most of his good work done, he's staying late at the precinct. He's doing some computer work. Bad for his eyes, though. Bad for his <laughs> eyes in the dark. Why can't he turn on a light while he does his computer work? <laughs> Dad's a hacker. It's almost like a Word document because he's literally typing out, like, password, space, then the <laughs> password, code, space, then the code. It pulls up just a ton of information. Five floppy disks full of information. <laughs> Meanwhile, Stan and Rico are at Martillo's now. So they went to Lucia's. To get a bag put on their head, they get taken out to Martillo, so that way they don't know where he is. All the good parties start with a bag <laughs> on your head. Welcome to Fight Club. First yeah. rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> as soon as they get there, Martillo says, you guys are chumps. I looked up Cooper. He's not worth anything. He doesn't have any money. <laughs> Ouch. Why am I going to sell to you? And in Tubbs' <laughs> desperation, so it was a Cuban. <laughs> I'm here doing this for a Cuban. And Martillo changes his mind. <laughs> I like Cubans. That's good. <laughs> and come yeah. to find out they found out so, Tubbs' so real I, background, his financial background. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have a place to live. You live in your car. <laughs> Cooper probably wouldn't have a very good rep considering all of the people he is a middleman for either end up dead or arrested. <laughs> True. True story. <laughs> the next day at the precinct, Gina's telling Dad how Ramos died. Clean 9mm, no markings. He's like, yeah, I know. I... No, this is Reese that did it. I was there. All the markings. <laughs> and then in his office, he's talking to Tubbs and Rico, or sorry, to Rico and Stan. And they're explaining what happened. And Dad just got his hand over his face. He's like, God damn it. It's like a Cuban? Really? Like, yeah. <laughs> that's what you came up with. Tubbs is, Tubbs is explaining his brilliant idea of how. So I made up this imaginary Cuban. <laughs> So they want to meet with this Cuban guy. So, like, we got to... Do you know any Cubans? We need to find a Cuban. Dad says, don't worry. We don't need to get anyone else like the people that Tubbs mentions. You got the best Cubano right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then that night at Lucia's club, Castillo goes with Tubbs to talk to Martillo, and they're going to arrange to buy, like, $17 million worth of cocaine. But they leave on a good faith deal because the... Cubano says he will only do business unless he can see the boat. And so they say, okay, for $2 million as a down payment, we will show you the boat. You can come out and do that tomorrow. Tubbs and Castillo leave, and you see Martillo point to Lucia, and he says some things to his bodyguard, which I don't know if anything ever comes to that. <laughs> That's just there. <laughs> <laughs> now, out at Castillo's, Dad is a home alone. Having dinner alone in the dark. Like you do when you're a lonely man that works a lot. <laughs> when all you do is think about your ex-wife. Exactly. And where she went. She just uh-huh. walked off. And she, I mean, she didn't say anything. Yeah, maybe you thought she was coming back. For weeks. She's just gone. <laughs> she just disappeared. I don't understand what happened. And then Reese comes in and eats his entire dinner. Doesn't just say like, oh, I mean, he does say in a really racist way. Now I'm quoting here. Don't hold this against me. Still with that Jap food, huh, Marty? What the fuck, Reese? Mm-hmm. Well, Reese is a jerk, obviously. Yeah. But then he eats the whole meal. Yeah, and then, yeah, he just starts sticking his fingers right in his <laughs> general chow's chicken. <laughs> I swear to God, I thought he said right in his genitals. <laughs> I was, like, really confused. I'm like, who had their what? No. <laughs> he's super confident, Reese is. You know, he's bas- he basically tells Dad that he quit on America and that uh, when he's done, he'll tip him off about drugs. Reese's pitch here is, let me have Martillo 
And then I'll let you know where the drugs go on the street and you can arrest them on the street. Yeah, that's not an even trade off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just more upset that he ate his entire meal. Dad's entire. He even drinks his drink. <laughs> he, he eats it all with his hands. You know, like, uh, he was dead. He almost never eats. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him. He's like a bird. He's so frail. <laughs> so at the precinct, they're getting ready now. Tubbs is going to go do the boat tour and then they're going to do the bus. Now, remember, they're so sunny, so we're going to have some white guy sit-ins. <laughs> <laughs> or sunny. Like, so. who are these people? Like <laughs> kind of look like sunny. Kind of. They're going through the entire setup of what's going to happen. They got the money on a loan from the evidence locker. Wildcard is Reese. They don't know what he's doing. He's operating outside the law. If Castillo gets a call from the CIA, says he is working on one of their cases, then they'll have to back off. But otherwise, they have to assume they're just going to move forward and not wait for whatever is going to happen with Reese, they're going to make their bust. So all the kids scamper off and dad's left there alone. He's making a phone call back to the CIA to see if he can find out any additional information. That's when Reese comes back. Dad doesn't have an answer from the CIA and Reese isn't going to give him any additional information on what's happening. And Reese's attitude's a little different now because you can see that Marty's going to go through with this. He's still going to try and run the sting. And so, you know, he comes in, he's like, he's got that whole kind of not cool Marty. Not cool. <laughs> kind of glances around, you know. So now we're off to the ship. There's no deal here with Reese and Castillo. No information of what Reese is up to. The vice team is moving forward, making arrests on Martillo. They go to the ship. It goes down exactly as planned. Tubbs goes down. He's wearing a wire. He sees all the drugs. He does his test. He's laughing. Everything looks good. It looks like it's a good deal. They go up to the top of the ship. And instead of, you know, it could go smooth, but Tubbs got to punch someone. We've got to have a little bit of a shootout. Gina's going to kill someone. That's what she does. <laughs> yep. Uh-huh. Well, I, I think things look smoother if they stop testing the drugs like a cop would. You know, they pull out the little vial and dump it in and shake up the little thing. Like, oh, yep, it's blue. But this is one of the smoother drug busts in vice history. Like, they get everyone, only one person dies. No cops are hurt, uh, unlike normal. Everything's good. It's almost like with someone missing, everything <laughs> runs more efficiently. <laughs> Melissa's face is priceless. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. So right when everything's going the most perfect, that's when Reese comes flying in in his helicopter and he just hovers. threatens <laughs> and hovers over them with a mounted machine gun saying, let Martillo go. You can have everyone else. Let Martillo go. Come on, Martillo. Come on, boy. Jump. Come on. Jump. Come you on can do over. It. You can make it. <laughs> Dude, and, and I don't blame them for giving uh, giving up Martillo. He shows up in the helicopter. And Tubbs is yelling at him in the helicopter. Man, that's unfair. We, we can't match up against the helicopter. <laughs> Martillo runs off. He jumps in the helicopter. The helicopter starts flying away. And we zoom in on Martillo. What does he have? A red dot on the middle of his chest. Freeze frame. Gunfire sound. Martillo just got snipered. Yep. I was stunned when I saw that. In total shock that that's what happened, that he got snipered. There's only one person in the entire world that would have the reason to do it. But the question is, is would he? So we go to the final scene mm. of the episode and we're at Castillo's. Tubbs is standing in the shadows <laughs> while Castillo sits on the floor staring out the window. Like he does. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs is giving Castillo an update on what happened with Martillo. And Dad's like, yeah, I know, but don't leave yet. Tubbs is not going to directly ask him if he was the mystery sniper. And Dad's not going to directly admit to it. And Castillo says, I just want you to make sure that you remember that I always do what's right. And that may be messy, but I always do the right thing. For honor, like in the name of honor. And then we... And if you cross me, we'll shoot you from I'll very far away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's it. That's the end of the episode. We get left with knowing that Castillo is a murderer. Hey, that guy hacked his friend up to pieces and some poor kid that was making a drawer. Okay. <laughs> if Castillo has to shoot a couple guys in a helicopter to get revenge, that's what has to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts about the end of this episode, including Sonny's disappearance. It was Sonny that did the shooting. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny was a sniper. He was in the military. True. It could have been him. Yeah, it's true. true. But it would be different. Yeah, it's because been known to kill people. 
True story. Dad <laughs> has a history of this where he goes rogue <laughs> and does whatever he thinks is right, including samurai people in between palm trees on a random island. Yeah, all, all people that deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not seeing the, the problem with any of this. I'm coming back to this. I'm coming back to this <laughs> argument. Let's go table it because we're going to have it. <laughs> let's go talk about music first and then we'll get there. Let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John. We've talked about big name artists before that have appeared in Vice episodes. And we talked about their cost coming down on how much money they can spend on music. But one of these bands is not like any of the others that has ever been in an episode of Vice and probably costs a lot of money. Yeah, so we have two pretty big names in music. And I'm going to start with I Want Your Hands on Me by Sinead O'Connor. Uh, because I feel like I have a, a little less to talk about with her than the other one. Sinead O'Connor, being an Irish singer-songwriter who rose to fame in the late 80s, her debut album, The Lion and the Cobra, in 1987, that debut album would go gold and get a Grammy nom. As a teen, got into trouble quite a bit. Later on, she would talk about in interviews how her parents were abusive, and that's one of the reasons why she's such a an advocate against like child abuse and stuff like that her teen years when she was getting into trouble she actually spent 18 months in an asylum slash you know, like one of those asylums that are run by nuns after getting out of there in 1984 she would meet calm forelli and form the band ton ton makuti makuti <laughs> soon after she would drop out of school and start Play music full time, and it would get her noticed by Ensign Records, and they would give her a manager who was the former head of YouTube's Mother Records, Fachintna O'Sele. <laughs> Damn you, Irish people, and your goofy ass names! Like I am sure that that name is like Fa Shela or or Che or, or Shalele, but who knows? Did you just say Shalele? <laughs> Yes, her manager, Shalele, who was the head of YouTube's Mother Records. He was very outspoken politically, and they said that he rubbed off on Sinead, which we will talk about momentarily. She had quite a bit of help. So other than that, she also was working with YouTube guitarist The Edge, and they co-wrote the song Heroin, which was used for the soundtrack for the film Captive. The Edge also helped work with her on their debut album, The Lion and the Cobra. That debut album would be a sensation. It would, it would be massive. And then she would follow that up with, I do not want what I haven't got, NME would rate the second best album of the year and would also give us her cover of the Prince song, Nothing Compares to You. Which is crazy that that was a Prince and song. <laughs> and, and it's around this time uh, when she would don her trademark shaved head. So she was really coming in her own in the 90s. She was even asked to join uh, a bunch of other guests for the Roger Waters Pink Floyd massive performance of The Wall in Berlin in 1990. We'll cross over there with the next band we're going to talk about. From there, she would do a ton of compilations with other artists. She would release some singles, do some soundtrack work, and ultimately she would continually release albums. I mean, all the way until now. Her albums have been somewhat successful, not quite as successful as, as her peak. In the uh, 2000s, she started experimenting with different styles, which included a 2005 reggae album called Throw Down Your Arms. <laughs> well, that is different. <laughs> they, she even has a new album in 2000, supposed to come out in 2019. Now, that new album is going to come out under her new name because in... 2017, she legally changed her name to Magda DeVitt. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So, in total, she's released 10 solo albums. Talking about Sinead O'Connor, as much as the music that you have to talk about are the controversies. So, in 1990, she announced she would not perform if the United States anthem was played before her concert, in which Frank Sinatra would go. Uh, would go on record saying that he would kick her in the ass. <laughs> so, which, by the way, I don't know if I've ever been to a concert in which they played the national anthem before it. I'm assuming, except for Springsteen concerts, that that's not a a, a 
typical thing. <laughs> Especially, you know, with, with artists from the UK. But whatever. So, in 92, she would make a Saturday Night Live appearance, and she would perform the song, Bob Marley's Song War. It would be an a cappella version that none of the producers were aware of that she was going to be doing. And in the middle of the performance, she would pull out a photo of Pope John Paul II while singing the verse Evil, and then tear it up into little pieces and throw it at the camera. That would spark quite the controversy. Immediately, it would be met without applause or booing, but just utter silence in the studio. <laughs> the rage would lead to 4,400 total calls of complaints, and the SNL host that night was Joe Pesci. He would remark later that if it was his show, he would get he would give her a smack he would give her <laughs> such a smack so here we got frank sinatra and joe pesci both threatening violence towards sinead o'connor so uh, joe pesci gonna smack her on the mouth the threats would not just come from them so madonna would her next snl appearance she would then mock her by tearing up a photo of joey buttafuoco <laughs> Follow that up with a number of criticisms about Sinead that involved how wonderful Madonna is. Yeah, that sounds well, I mean, about right. Yeah, that's yeah, what Madonna yeah. does. <laughs> uh, yeah, it has nothing to yeah, do with, like, yeah. I have an opinion here. It's more like, I'm going to capitalize on this. We go from there to 1995, in which she called in and then randomly showed up at a recording of a TV show called After Dark. Uh, I guess the talk show was doing a panel in which they were having a discussion about child abuse and how at the time with Catholic priests, how it was an epidemic there. And so and she decided to randomly show up on set and give her two cents. And then in 2013, she also published an open letter to Miley Cyrus about the treatment of women in the music industry. Outside of that, she dealt with some health issues. She's talked about in interviews how she has dealt with bipolar issues. Briefly, during the 2000s, dealt with a bout of fibromyalgia as well. Obviously, if you want to know more about her political and religious beliefs, just Google her. Uh, she talks about that crap all the time. <laughs> the next song in our music and final song is The Dogs of War by Pink Floyd, who obviously is an English rock band formed in 1965 and one of the most commercially successful and influential groups in pop music history. Pink Floyd was founded by Sid Barrett, who was at the time the lead singer and guitarist, and was made up of Nick Mason on drums, Roger Waters on bass and vocals, and Richard Wright on keyboards and vocals, and would later include David Gilmore, who would take over on guitar and, you guessed it, vocals. Because everybody's got to sing. <laughs> Except Nick Mason. He knows his place. <laughs> you know, it, what's a weird twist with Pink Floyd? I know this, this is going to sound weird, but they are an underappreciated band. Even though they are a gigantic success and everyone knows Pink Floyd music and everyone is aware of The Wall and Dark Side of the Moon, they are underappreciated for what they are. They are a life changing generation changing band that with sid barrett and david gilmore takes over as full-time lead singer here they continue to change themselves so many times and really change how music is created in my opinion like on the level of the beatles for changing how a whole generation looks at music i don't think a lot of people realize a lot of people know the pink floyd like you said the wall dark side of the moon and like wish you were here like they know that music of them i think people would be surprised if they went out and checked out like the Piper at the Gates of Dawn, which was their first album. Even their last album, Final Cut, because they had a lot more albums than what most people know. And they were they, their sound was completely different on those albums, too. But most of their original Sid Barrett stuff was very folky, whereas mm -hmm. Waters stuff was more psychedelic rock. And then they even got into the... When you got into the 80s and Gilmore kind of took over with things, they went total 80s progressive rock. So, but let's just jump into this real quick. Waters and Mason met while studying architecture in London. <laughs> they would join a band and it would eventually include Wright. So the original band would be Roger Waters, Nick Mason, and uh, Richard Wright. And that iteration of the would be called Sigma Six. And they would go through several name changes, all right? And, and you know, you guys know me. I love the pre-band name, pre uh, <laughs> names, right? <laughs> Believe it or not, one of the names after Sigma Six was Megadeths, plural. <laughs> Megadeths, 
plural. Nice. They could have been the original Megadeth. The same. <laughs> they were also the Abdabs and the Screaming Abdabs. <laughs> then they were the Leonard's Loggers and the Spectrum 5 before finally se- settling on the name The T-Set. <laughs> The band would change some of the lineups, and that is when Barrett would join in. Actually, they would first refer to themselves as the Pink Floyd Sound, when another band named the T-Set named T- would show up for the same gig in 1965. So what happened was is that they both showed up for the same gig. They were both called the T-Set. Obviously, you can't have the band the T-Set come on after the band the T-Set. <laughs> Barrett quickly came up with the band name, which he just took two names of blues artists that he had in, in his record collection, being Pink Anderson and Floyd Council, making up the Pink Floyd sound. By 1966, they would have they dropped the sound part, and they started picking up the more psychedelic sound. Also got started to get more of the long instrumentals. This is when they started playing the London Underground. But by 67, Sid Barrett began to unravel. And this is also when he started using LSD. And it would not take very long for him to, for, for him to start to go downhill. He would show up at shows and interviews, be largely despondent. Uh, just kind of staring off at stuff. They were trying bringing in David Gilmore, friend and former classmate of Sid's, to play guitar. And at first, David Gilmore was just brought in to play Sid's guitar parts to just lip sync Sid's vocals. But it became quickly apparent that Sid was not gonna not gonna be able to contribute much as the band went on after Gilmore joined in December '68, or I'm sorry, in December '67. By April 68, Barrett would end up being out of the band, and that would force Roger Waters into taking over, basically, as the primary writer. 1968 album, Saucer of Secrets, featured Barrett's final con- contributions, as well as Waters' first songs, first songs that he actually wrote. They would follow that up with 1970s album, Adam Heart Mother, which is actually their first number one album. Ultimately, under Barrett, they would have uh, they only released two charting singles and one album, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn in 67. Now that Barrett was gone and Gilmore was in the band, Waters really uh, took over uh, to the point where she started pushing, it started to really kind of piss off the members of the band. We roll out with Dark Side of the Moon, which would ultimately their be-, be their best-selling album, third best-selling album of all time, first number one album in the u.s would remain on the billboard charts for 14 years it is insane how that album performed and continues to perform and every generation it's like it gets discovered for the first time again and and, i mean they would just knock it out of the park with the the next follow-ups they would follow that up with wish you were here in 75 animals in 77 and then the wall in 79 and then finally final cut in 83 as this iteration of pink floyd wish you were here is basically written by waters as a biography of the rise and fall of sid barrett animals written about the george orwell novel animal farm and then the wall is basically about waters childhood so this is where i was going to jump in and talk about how much of a pink floyd nerd and fan that i am and it really has to do with these three albums is Dark Side of the Moon, Animals, and The Wall. So for me, my favorite album from Pink Floyd is Animals. But with Wish You Were Here, I would argue to say that that is the greatest love album that has ever been made. Now, Roger Waters will say that Wish You Were Here, the song, is about his marriage and then divorce. But Shine On You Crazy Diamond is probably the greatest love song that's ever been written because it is about Sid Barrett and them missing that he is not part Mm -hmm. of that band and he's still alive he's just not there with them they can't handle him anymore and that guilt like that they're carrying that they can't handle one of their friends anymore i would argue say that's one of the best love songs that have ever been made two is i would say that time from dark side of the moon is my favorite song from pink floyd and it's really because of the lyrics now the the guitar is great It it hit it out of the park with that song but there's these lyrics that go over and over in my head and I have them here. I'm going to read them real fast. So you run and you run to catch up with the sun, but it's sinking. Racing around to come up behind you again. The sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older. Shorter of breath, one day closer to death. That section of quote from that song goes 
through my head a hundred times a week. You're right. Like the, just the symbolism and, and everything just lyrically with that is just fantastic. And I'm with you. I would say Shine On You Crazy Diamond is probably my favorite of theirs. Is that that probably gets the most a weekly from me because I just love that song. And that song has got such a nice, it's got such a nice long instrumental through it too that I, I can just kind of lose myself in it for a good 10 minutes. Reading the biographies and stuff, most of that is Roger Waters. That That's him writing. Now, the band always contributed but during the making of these albums as they went album to album. Bickering of the band was constantly that Roger, Roger Waters didn't feel like they were con the other members of the band were contributing enough as far as writing songs and <laughs> stuff like that. The other members of the band were upset because they were being paid per song and Roger Waters was making more money than the rest of the band because he was writing all the songs. <laughs> and they accused him of pretty much not letting them contribute, basically by saying like they could kicking their songs off the album for his. Back and forth, ultimately it would lead to 1982's final cut, which would basically be like a Roger Waters solo album, and it would ultimately be what pushed the band over the edge. Now, in 79, they had already booted out uh, Richard Wright because of his, they believed his, his divorce was getting in the way and he wasn't contributing anymore. And then after 82, Waters decided, hey, you know, I'm doing all the work here. I'm going to go out on my own. So Waters released his first solo album, Pros and Cons of, the, of Hitchhiking, in 85. And at the same time, Waters also tries to go through every way possible to legally prevent Gilmore and the rest of the band members from continuing with Pink Floyd. So lawsuits to prevent them to use the name, including a lawsuit to try and dissolve the band, which would eventually lead to Gilmore winning the lawsuits and still holding on to permission. So, and I like what Gilmore did too. They ended up working and bringing Richard Wright back into the band so they had mm. more founding members in the band. <laughs> then that way they were like, no, 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 no. See, we've got founding members too, so we can go play Pink Floyd music as well. From 85 on, Waters started doing his solo stuff and David Gilmore took over writing the music, which they would end up releasing two more albums and those albums would be A Momentary Lapse of Reason in 87 and The Division Bell in 94. And there's just bickering over the years between Roger Waters and David Gilmore. There was never really a reunion until 2005 they reunited for a Live 8 show in London. First time since, you know, Know, since the early 80s that Waters and the entire band played together. In 2006, Sid Barrett will, passed away. And then in 2008, Richard Wright would pass away. And that would lead to Mason and Gilmore putting together their final album, The Endless River, in 2014, ultimately without Waters. They were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 96, and as of 2013, have sold over 250 million records, which is insane. Because I can't go on and on and on and on about this, I am cutting a lot of little details out that I normally like to focus on. I will say that Pink Floyd is definitely a band worth learning about, even if you just want to learn about the individuals. Now, I have read a little bit of Sid Barrett's stuff. He's a very interesting guy to read about. There's controversy as far as what was actually wrong with Sid Barrett. A lot of people have said that he was schizophrenic, mm -hmm. but other people said that his mental deterioration was caused by an overdose of LSD. And then there've it's been talked about in interviews, like there was an interview with uh, David Gilmore where he talked about where he felt that Barrett was schizophrenic and that that overdose of LSD was just a catalyst. I definitely recommend there's some good biographies out there. Well, I guess you could say the song is over. I thought I had more to say. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much stuff about Pink Floyd and there there isn't enough time to talk about them, especially because the band kept, even without Roger Waters, kept releasing music into the 90s. Their career as a yeah. band spanned 30 plus years. I mean, it's one of the things that I wish I could get a chance to see is a performance of the wall, but not enough time to talk about it right now. I will be happy to talk more about Pink Floyd any other time. 
just maybe not on the record. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode because I've been sitting on some controversial thoughts here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts. All right. Melissa's giving me this slant-eyed look, so I think I'm going to start this time. That way she has a chance to respond to what I'm going to say. First, let's talk about Sunny. This has nothing to do with the actual episode. Let's talk about Miami Vice a little bit here. I'm starting to think that the Amnesia story arc was what they knew was going to be the last hurrah of Don Johnson being full-time on Miami Vice. The Amnesia arc was to be his like big moment for the show. Because there was no way that they were going to be able to keep him in the capacity that they were. He was a huge star. So, of course, he's got movies going on. He's got music. He was number one on the Hot 100. He's got a duet with Barbara Streisand, his mega star girlfriend. That's also on the Hot 100 when this episode came out. He is a mega star. And everyone else on the show has other stuff going on at the same time. Stan, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. He was in Rambo, Gina and Trudy and... Edward James almost. Edward James, Edward James almost just won it or was nominated for a freaking Oscar. They all have so much going on, so they weren't able. There's no way they were going to be able to keep Don Johnson's 100% of his focus. And so it makes sense to me now, like with the amnesia arc, that means it's justified that he's away during season five, that he's not to be there. But I can, knowing like how that this is the last season of the show and all that stuff, it's like really transparent. Oh, well, he's busy doing other stuff. This is our quote unquote opportunity to showcase the other actors that are on Vice. But secretly behind closed doors, other than Philip Michael Thomas and Don Johnson, everyone else had to sign a contract saying they wouldn't act in other things while being on Miami Vice, which is a point of contention. For everyone else who, when they look back on the show, they say that they couldn't be in other things, so they signed contracts and that they would only be in Vice. So just an observation of mine, seeing how where the amnesia arc fits in here when it comes to the history of Miami Vice. Now, this is where most is going to get angry at me. Castillo has done this before, and he goes rogue. And these are my favorite stories, just like most would agree. The best stories are Castillo stories because his stories are so different. He's very passionate. He's very forward. He gets mixed up in very different things than what the rest of the Vice team gets. But this is where I'm going to have a problem with it. He demands loyalty and rule following when you work for him, which he has to follow neither personally. He does whatever the hell he wants to. On his watch, if he justifies someone needs to die, they die. If he says, I'm going to do this work on, on my regular payroll time, even though it's a personal vendetta, he will do that. And he was willing to murder anyone to make that happen. And I think that the problem with the vice team and how they, you know, he talks about all the time, like you follow the rules, don't take things personal, but he takes everything extremely personal. So if there's a problem with the vice team, maybe it should start with the leadership. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? You crazy. <laughs> <laughs> how is he not? Well, okay, back the train up here. First of all, the people that he that he has killed or that he has gone rogue with, he was protecting somebody who was protecting the child and the mother from people. So he had to go samurai on their asses, okay? <laughs> was he supposed to let them die? I don't understand. Like, that was not on Vice time. He was gone. He took some days what off. About, he, he did what he was supposed to do. What, what about his little that just showed up from Cambodia who turned out to actually not be... But he didn't do anything uh, in that anyone. one. He didn't kill anybody in that. <laughs> That's just a story that he was helping them. So they, were, they, were doing, they were solving actual crimes. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, like, in, in that storyline... What, how was he wrong for... Def they were going to be murdered. So he did what he was supposed to do to protect them. These people cut his friend up with a machete. Okay? They macheted his ass. <laughs> <laughs> also, the reason why he doesn't let the other people that work under him go rogue is because he's trying to protect them. And if they do something where they go rogue or they do something like with Sonny going and murdering people, what does he do? He does protect them when he can. He's trying... He, he, that's what he's doing right now. He's trying to get Sonny out of this the best he can. He's doing what he's supposed to be. He's doing, he's being a good leader. He tells them, don't do this. If you do it, you, you need to, you need to follow the rules. <laughs> but he helps them if they, if they go rogue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, you're following an arguing couple. <laughs> what are your final thoughts on this episode? All right. This didn't have a very good criminal organization behind it. So I get the storyline behind Castillo and his former co-worker rival let's go back to the criminal at his 
but that his former co-worker is is behind. Okay, so we get the first the scene early that for somehow they shoot up a limo, and that means that they can now steal a boat. So now we got these <laughs> people that they, they've stolen the drug boat. And they've they've sailed it to Miami. Get to Miami, and at no point in the episode do they actually sell any of the drugs on the boat. <clears throat> and it doesn't look at any point in the episode like they're trying very hard to sell the drugs on the. Boat. <laughs> they're working way hard to find some to of them. All of them. They end up making a deal reluctantly <laughs> with the one guy who they said's rep wasn't very good. Because he knows some random Cuban guy. <laughs> the vice team essentially nams him. Like, like no problem. Sting goes well. Everything goes perfect. And, and they, they arrest him. And, like, so, like, the criminal element throughout the show, like, like they were pretty lacking. So, and we <laughs> didn't get a whole lot of information about him. Like, we didn't really get any backstory on who these guys were. Lucia, like, we have no idea who... What, how did Lucia, other than owning the club, how did she fit into this at all? <laughs> um, I don't know. It, it seemed like everything went pretty simple. And what really bugged me at the end was that they're doing all of this to get the drugs on the boat and keep those off street and to arrest the people there. Now, they have been successful in all of these elements. The only thing they haven't been successful about is that the guy, the main guy that his former co is protecting is about to get away. But otherwise, they've prevented all of the drugs from getting off the boat. They're arresting all of the people involved. Everything is working out. And then Castillo just can't let it go. Cannot <laughs> let it go. So it, it, it's, it has nothing to do with the case. It, it, this is personal between him and Reese. Reese is about to fly away with the, with the main boss guy. And Castillo's like, you know what? I'm going to shoot him and just screw up your little mission. Just to make sure. If I, had, if I didn't screw it up completely before, I'm going to screw up just that last little part too. But it's completely unnecessary. Virtually, he shoots a guy who's a puppet for the CIA, as far as we're led to believe. And in the end, it already seized the boat. They had already arrested the people. Like, they won already. I don't know. This <laughs> felt definitely more like... Castillo and Reese just having a rivalry that goes back to their CIA days. I, I think most of this with uh, Castillo kind of going rogue with this is more about the fact that he just doesn't like this prick. And he came in and stuck his hands all in my food. <laughs> and I'm going to screw this up for him. And that includes shooting his man as he tries to fly away. <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. There's some controversial opinions here at the end, and we would <laughs> love to hear from you. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Get us on Facebook, facebook.com slash goalwiththeheat. Twitter, at goalwiththeheat. Instagram, at goalwiththeheat. You know how to get a hold of us. Where do you stand on this with Castillo? Me and John were kind of hard on Dad this week about his decision to take this. A little bit more personal than we and anticipated. And also wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to check out that website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe, all the ways to support us. Support step number one, send us that email, GoWithTheHeat.gmail.com. Step two, go review the show on iTunes. And step three, check out that Patreon, Patreon.com slash GoWithTheHeat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.